So we'll be starting about five minutes past, and that's about two minutes according to my clock. We're at three minutes past the hour. We'll start in just two more minutes. Well, okay. Well, welcome. Thank you for everybody attending. It's an honor to have you here. Um, we're all here to learn more about the, the name and uh, our efforts to renaming the, the town. So uh, without anything else, I'd like to start us off on a positive note. So I'd like to transition us to Darlene Franco, our local Wachumni chairperson to lead us and offer us a prayer. It is Hoyo Oshinem Darlene Franco, not the Inyana Uh um, I'm very happy to be here today and I'm very honored that uh, I was asked to do the opening prayer. I am from the local Wukchumni Yokuts people here in the valley and I offer this prayer in a good way. So everybody just pray in your own way. He didn't in Tripni, he didn't in Shoyampa'an, not the Witsit Wanayak. Amid Gana, Amid Gananwa. Amid Gnam Yoka Jinyana Tripni Amid Gna Mokolo and Yana Amid Gnam um, Nochi. I give thanks for all good things we've been blessed with. I give thanks for the air and the water and the fire and the land. I give thanks for all of the people that work hard on this issue today and the people that are presenting and educating. I give thanks to all the children that are our future, and I give thanks to our ancestors. I ask you to open our minds and open our hearts. Help us to receive all that is good. Help us to have open, clear minds in a good way. Offer these things in a good way. Ho, on Yokich, all my relations. And I'm offering this tobacco and medicine. I'm out here at the community garden, and I'm offering this tobacco and medicine for the sake of everybody here on this call with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'd like to lay a few ground rules and uh, remind everybody that we are uh, recording and that the uh, panelists will be the only ones able to speak. However, uh, you, the audience, will be able to comment in the chat section, uh, which can be read aloud. And with that being said, uh, we just ask that you keep your uh, comments and uh, to a respected uh, manner and uh, that anything that is disrespectful or derogatory will be uh, removed. 
And uh, with that, I'd like to bring our uh, first uh, speaker, Miss um, Morningstar Galley, who's the current director of the Restoring Justice for Indigenous People. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, there we go. So here is um, a slide deck that we will present. I um, just wanna say so much appreciation and respect to Darlene Franco and to the Franco family for welcoming us and for all of the um, dedication that they have to continuing on um, language revitalization and so much cultural revitalization, revitalization just very appreciative of, of their entire family. Um, my name is Morning Star Galley. I am Ajumawi Band of Pitt River. I am currently on the homelands of the Nisanan, Miwok, and Maidu peoples. Um, and so it's an honor to be here with all of you today and just present um, some information here. If we can go to the next slide. And so I just wanted to share that, you know, this isn't an isolated um, situation or incident in terms of, of addressing the name change issue for the Valley, that there are currently 113 names within California. And so you can go to the USGS database um, to look up all of those names. And if we can go to the next slide here. Um, and so there is the California Advisory Committee on Geographic Names. And so currently there are five proposed name changes of the S word throughout California. Um, and that does not include the current efforts to change the name um, of, of the slur word within the S Valley area. And to the next one. Um, and so I was asked how this connects in terms of the efforts to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, um, two-spirit relatives. And so we also use MMIR to be encompassing of all genders um, and all of our relatives. And so this is um, a quote from John Dorian of the Cree Nation that it's used to ridicule us and make women feel like they're worthless. When you're promoting that kind of information towards Aboriginal women, it becomes dangerous. And so this is an effort back in 2016 to outlaw the use of the word within schools, place names, and all public places that serve Indigenous peoples. And so the information that you'll hear today is part of and to um, you know, participate in, in this, you know, truth telling, the truth and healing initiatives um, as of today. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and so this is um, an image design of violence against the land is violence against our bodies and how that um, connects. And so I just want to share that the disappearance and trafficking of Indigenous women and girls um, here in California started with the gold rush and the enslavement and incarceration of California's Indigenous peoples began with missionization 250 years ago that Indigenous peoples have been disappeared and murdered um, and that not only was the theft of indigenous lands committed, but that was done in exchange for native women's bodies. Um, and in doing so, they erased our tribal place names and created names with the slur as an expletive, as a way to further cause violence, harm, erasure, and invisibility. This furthered a goal of upholding white supremacy and colonization in a way that is demeaning and derogatory to indigenous women and girls. And so what we see in terms of this erasure in terms of the way that, um, you know, I'll just mention that I was back home within my tribal lands yesterday and there, there was an effort that we were able to halt um, these wind turbines that are being placed, um, that are being proposed on our tribal lands. And so just to hear, you know, this continued narrative, um, especially within rural areas that are very ignorant and there's people that will say, I've been here for, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and it's very dismissive of our tribal creation stories of how it is that, you know, we have a responsibility to protect our land and our sacred places and, a, and in a way that this resource extraction occurs 
um, in terms of, of depleting our lands and territories. And so um, the connection between indigenous women's bodies and the connection between the resource extraction and how the violence is committed against our, our mother earth. And so we see that um, demonstrated in terms of the naming. Um, and so we've been participating in the name change efforts from everything from school mascots um, and mascot issues um, to, to this larger movement um, against removing the S name all across Turtle Island. So with that, I will stop and I look forward to any um, comments or questions that you have towards the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Morningstar. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, we did receive um, some uh, comments in the section. Uh, we'd just like to go ahead and read them if you had a chance. Okay, we'll go ahead and hold our comments to the end, I guess. And um, let me bring on our next speaker, who is um, James Martin from Valley Names for Change. And he's also a registered artist of the Choctaw Nation. Um, James. Hey, halito, halito akana. Sa hochafe ya James Martin. Chata hatak siya hoke. Kolo atowi in chunli siya hoke. Hi, my friends. My name is James Martin. Um, and I am a citizen of the Choctaw Nation. I'm a Choctaw man. Uh, I am also a registered artist of the Choctaw Nation. I am here uh, with Valley Natives for Change. So our group, Valley Natives for Change, how we came about was the, the changing of the mascot at Fresno High. Uh, Fresno High actually put out a post looking for uh, alumni students who are also uh, indigenous, have indigenous heritage. A buddy of mine had sent me that link, so I reached out and uh, they said, yes, we'd like to hear your perspective. Um, and I had mentioned this to another friend of mine who's also indigenous here locally. And she said, you know what? I know somebody else who was gonna speak about that. And they said, I'm gonna invite you to a Facebook group. Uh, this Facebook group was some people who I knew from the local community, some people who I didn't. Uh, and we all kind of came together and, and shared our view collectively uh, of what it meant as far as the, the Native American imagery and the mascot. Um, and surprisingly, what I found was, was my story wasn't unique. Uh, the things that I had went through, um, other people had went through, you know, and uh, we had never talked about it outside of this, uh, of this venue. Um, so, and then moving forward, um, speaking with Fresno High, uh, I do have to say, I believe they did a good job in, in hearing our side uh, again, I was a part of multiple uh, listening sessions where I, I got an opportunity to share my story. Um, other people got to share their story, their point of view as well. Um, and then I also got a, had an opportunity to speak each of the, um, the members of the school board directly and share them within my point of views, with the exception to one who wasn't interested to hear anything that I had to say. Um, but Moving forward, a lot of the things that the questions people ask is like, is it harmful? How is it harmful? Um, and there's there's a lot of statistics, right? There's a lot of studies that have been done. Um, they're out there. You can look them up and find them. I'm not really a numbers statistic kind of person myself. I tend to have uh, what I can offer is firsthand knowledge, firsthand experience um, and my story. So how did it how did it impact me? How did it affect me? Uh, the, the things that, that I uh, endured there at, during school, you know, was seeing people mimic culture to what they thought was Native American culture. And it, it, it kind of hurt. It's almost like if you've ever been a part of a group and everybody in the group is doing something extremely racist or offensive, and you kind of don't want to raise your hand to tell them that it's wrong. That's kind of what it felt like being in that environment. What it did um, past high school was it, it changed my view. Uh, it changed the way I interacted with people as far as being able to share my culture. Um, and then, it, and I, I carried that with me through most of my adult life. I only changed my perspective on that uh, recently um, to where now 
I, I don't believe that it's something I have to keep secret. It's something that I can be proud of. Um, and then some of the things that it's done to, to other members of our community of, of, as well, is just, it's appropriated our culture. It's made them pull away from their culture. There, there were stories given of, uh, of people who wanted to stop dancing, uh, stop participating in their, their own indigenous culture because of the things that the, the stereotype perpetuated. So those are some of the things of, of like how, how it can be harmful. And so the other argument is, so there's always somebody who says, I know somebody who's Native American and he says it doesn't bother him. That's great. Okay, good for him. You know, and I'm sure in, in any instance, you can find people on, on either side of the issue. Um, and there is a statistic out there that shows that once um, people who felt like that, they had no opinion of it or it didn't bother them once they were educated to the harmful effects um, that have been seen and, in, and been done in studies, they tend to change their views. Um, and we've seen that within our own groups as well, within people that we talk to here locally. Uh, I've talked to many people who are like, man, you know, it kind of doesn't, doesn't bother me, you know, but they didn't go to Fresno High or they didn't go to a school that had that mascot. And when I explained to them the experiences I had, they said they would say, man, that's terrible. I'm sorry you had to go through that. And they can kind of see what that image does and how it's not just uh, a harmless image. Um, the other argument is history. Um, a lot of people argue that it's, it's been this for a very long time. You know, it's true, it has. It's been that way. Uh, I've, I've heard numbers of 130 years. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, but because something has always been done doesn't automatically make it right. Um, there, there are things that have been done without taking any consideration of marginalized groups uh, before um, our opinions didn't matter as much. Uh, even recently, they didn't matter as much. Even when, when I was in school, uh, my opinion didn't matter because I was the one guy who, who had a problem with it, right? Um, at least I thought, that's the way I felt. Um, but come to find some of my other classmates who were also indigenous that I didn't even know at the time were struggling with the same issues that I was, uh, but it wasn't talked about. A lot of people will tell me, why didn't you bring it up then? And that, you know, when you're, you know, 15, 16, 17, the last thing you want to do is, is stand out and, and, and fight, you know, a lot of times. Some people have that courage. I didn't. I just wanted to enjoy my high school experience. I wanted to play sports. You know, I wanted to be accepted. Uh, so when I, when I saw my classmates uh, dancing around, uh, mimicking what they thought indigenous culture was uh, and telling me how it's honoring, you know, uh, my ancestors, I would say, we don't do that. I've never seen anybody do that. I've never been a part of a ceremony or been anywhere where I've seen anybody act in this way. This is just what the stereotype is perpetuating. This is what Hollywood has taught them. Um, and, and, it's, and it's things like that that need to be brought to light, why people I think we just need to understand each other. If we can understand each other and understand each other's culture better, uh, we would be able to move forward in these, in these issues. Um, and and what, what exists from this is a generational trauma. It's a, a trauma that happens from one generation to the next and gets passed down. Um, and is, and is, it's taught that it should just be accepted because this is the way it's always been. Uh, when, when people are saying, we're trying to change history. You can't change history. History already happened. What we need to do is stop covering up history and teach the real history of the way things happen uh, and move forward in a better way. Um, when, when the people come up and they're, they're saying, this is my mascot and you're taking my mascot from me, it, that's, that's just not true. Their experience was their experience. What we're trying to do is create a safe environment for for all students moving forward. Uh, and so in, in any indigenous students don't have to feel that pressure uh, or deal with that same racism and, and not just from other students, but from faculty alike, you know, things that are perpetuated in a way um, that it's actually a safe environment for them and they can actually be proud of their culture. 
Um, and then I'd like to say too, one of the things that this did in, in getting the mascot uh, changed, they did vote to change it. Um, it started the process of healing moving forward. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people in our groups, uh, in, in our group, uh, various ages. Um, and there were some people who said, man, I can't believe this is actually happening because I thought it never would, you know, and it, and it, and it was such a relief to them to know that something that was always wrong in our eyes or in, in certain individuals' eyes has, has being corrected and, and their life, their culture, their values do matter. So it does, it does start that healing process moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, James. Yeah. Uh, right now, we'd like to send you guys, the audience, a, a survey and uh, kind of gauge uh, what your thoughts are before we move on to our next speaker. So we'll take uh, about 60 seconds, a minute, uh, to put that survey out there and for all of you to kind of answer it. We'll just give it a little bit longer and then um, we'll move on to Josefa from the ACLU uh, who will read some of the comments and questions that you, the audience, have been uh, uh, submitted in the Q&A and chat section. So we got a comment uh, from Jamie Nelson who stated, the push to remove colonial settler uh, slurs, imagery, and culturally offensive ideas is not a border discussion, meaning it, is, it shouldn't be limited to a specific region. Um, fighting racism is not an issue for townies. The idea of out-of-towners not having a voice in this discussion is both illogical and historically inaccurate. And this speaks to um, uh, the main opponent of the rename campaign, Nathan Magzik, who has argued that time and time again. And again, it speaks to the issue of this just being um, a slur, derogatory and racist period. It doesn't matter who is offended by it, where they're located. Um, we know it's wrong and we know that it's time to change it. Um, we haven't had additional comments. So I do encourage folks to please um, ask your questions in the Q&A area or you're welcome to send a direct chat to panelists. So I'll pass it back to you, Roman. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry, I didn't realize it was, <laughs> I had muted myself. Uh, I'm very honored to bring our next speaker, uh, youth, to really uh, show that this isn't, we're not the first to uh, address these sort of issues, and we're probably not going to be the last generation to discuss these issues. So it's my distinct honor and pleasure to bring our youth speaker, uh, Mr. Malachi Suarez, who is a Central Unified fifth grader. Malachi. Hi, my name is Malachi Suarez. I am 10 years old and soon to be in the fifth grade. My, my, gate Central Unifi my gate Community Service Project is to change the name of my school, James K. Polk Elementary, because James K. Polk does not represent the ideals of our district. He used manifest destiny, the idea that some people are superior and more deserving based on the color of their skin to wage an unjust war and steal land from Mexicans and indigenous. Many Mexicans and indigenous were brutally murdered as a result. I would describe Manifest Destiny as someone to, coming to my house and saying that they deserve to live in my house more than my family does, and I have to leave and never come back. Polk was also a slave owner, and he was against ending slavery. He even had slaves at the White House. My school district named 
Named my school after Polk to celebrate westward expansion and our mascot, the Pioneers, to celebrate their courage and bravery. What our, what our school does not teach us is that Pioneers use Manifest Destiny to steal land and kill people who were like me. My school, my school district celebration of people who use racist ideas to steal land from people like me makes me feel angry and unwelcome. What makes me even more upset is that my school does not teach us of, um, <coughs> of, the, of the history of Polk and the pioneers. I feel like my school district wants us to think that Polk was a good person and that stealing land's okay. This makes me want, not want to go to my school if they want to celebrate racist people who do terrible things to people of color. This is very similar to the renaming of S Valley after a sexist, racist, and derogatory term, and then claiming that it is honoring Native Americans. These names were meant to send us a message, and it is now time to change that. Schools and places should be named schools and places should be named after positive people and things. Changing the name of my school would be good for our community. 85% of the Central Unified student body are minority students. We are encouraged when we see people like us being honored for, our, for their accomplishments by having schools named after them. Currently, not enough schools are named after people of color. Through my research, I learned that a community operates better when there is representation and equality. Diversity and representation elevate the community. Some name change ideas are I have are Maria Moreno, the first woman farm laborer to be hired as a union organizer in California, or Judge Armando Rodriguez, a person who did good things for Fresno, like helping establish Arte Americas. Soon my project will be an agenda item at a board meeting. You can help me change the name of my school by calling into the board and calling into that board uh, meeting to voice your support for the name change. Please visit my website at www.renamepolkelementary.com. There you can find an article about my project, my change.org petition, and the email address for my project. If you email us, we will, sh we will share current information about my project, including information about the upcoming board meeting we are stronger when we work together. I support renaming S Valley for the same reasons that I want to change the name of my school. Now is the time for change. Thank you for. Thank you, Malachi. Thank you. Wonderful having you. And thank you for sharing us, uh, your efforts to uh, remove and rename uh, your, your elementary school. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and share some additional comments that have been shared. Um, someone asked, do you see efforts to educate young kids as threatened given the current uh, statutes banning critical race theory courses was one question. Um, one comment was, let's start a large Native American museum in S Valley um, and uplift cultural studies. Um, another person asked if there are other campaigns to change the names of other towns uh, named S Valley or is, um, is it just the 93675 S Valley that's uh, up, up for debate? Uh, Morningstar, if you're able to share with them the, the other petitions in California with um, the Board of Geographic Names, I think that would be helpful. Um, a lot of admiration and respect for Malachi's work. Um, yeah, a lot of support from folks. No additional comments right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Lee Oliver, the Director of American Indian Studies at Fresno State. Dr. Lee Oliver. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lee Oliver. I'm Blackfeet and Choctaw. Um, it is a, 
just an honor to be here with you all and my very distinct privilege to follow um, young Malachi Suarez on such an impressive presentation. I think um, the point here is that I'll be um, mirroring a bit of, of what Malachi just shared as well. I'm so impressed to hear you talking about um, Western expansion and the legacies um, of racial bias and all of that's been left in, in place um, that we're dealing with today, like Polk's legacy, like the S word, um, and the fight to just sort of hold on to these old colonial ways of having mapped themselves onto land that didn't belong to them. And how they did that is what I want to talk a bit about today. So I guess my hope is that I can provide a little bit of a background and some more context um, and just hope I can offer something useful for the conversation. So um, thank you again for having me to all of um, my uh, friends, family and colleagues here. Um, I appreciate it. It's so nice to see um, people and be getting to know folks here in the Valley. Um, if you wanna move to the next slide, I'll um, start here. So in my own work, um, I started a long time ago uh, when I was a young person, kind of like Malachi, I was really baffled by all the good people in my family and all the racism. I mean, uh, you know, the, the poor treatment of women um, and also women of color, which takes on a kind of different, different type of sexism when you combine racism and sexism together. So that's part of what we're talking about here is how words matter and how they create concepts that are um, sort of allow people to justify how they treat others. If you think of people through stereotypes, you think of people through a, a, a shell of the human that they are, right? Um, and so that's some of what I want to share today. I do want to point out this picture. It is just beloved to me. It is a traditional um, style of clothing for um, uh, Northern Plains and Northwest uh, Native woman, um, younger woman here, and where you would typically see um, elk teeth adorning her dress, which would be a symbol of leadership that not only that you come from good hunters, um, but that you feed your people well, that you're a generous people, right? So we can start to understand some of the um, negativity today by understanding that um, that kind of generosity gets erased in who native people are as the colonizers are settling and as settlers are spreading throughout the United States. As Malachi pointed out, as Western expansion is taking place, you also get a renaming of people, a re-identification of people. Um, I like to, I teach and I like to share with my students um, sometimes that one way to think about colonialism is that it's, it's, it gets rooted in a couple hundred years of European history um, where lawyers and medical doctors and philosophers are all talking to each other and imagining that the world is only made of things that are resources. Other human beings are just resources to use. Trees are resources, water is. So they take the spiritual significance out of everything and they place it in a, a small place they call a church. Right? And they give the power of the sacred to very few people and everybody else is supposed to be their followers. That's fine if that's what works for you, right? Perfectly fine, not here to talk about people's religion, here to point out how that becomes an overwhelming way um, that native peoples are redefined. Um, and that's part of, of the renaming of places, but also people, right? And so, is they say, if you study some of this history, that colonialism represents this turn. And a turn is anything that happens in a, a sort of massive global scale where a sort of new consciousness takes over. And colonialism is one of those where they, they just sort of reformulate the world's people, right? Um, into these very few five, in fact, races. And, um, what does that do? Well, as I'm hoping to show today, how you define a people affects their legal rights, 
affects how they're treated by other citizens and um, the dignity that they're given and the right to speak on their own behalf. So go to the next slide. So this is in one way words matter. The S word is an important one. It's put in squaw, it's, it's put in quotes on purpose because this word shows up in colonial laws. This word shows up in colonial diaries. This is a word that um, Lewis and Clark used about the woman, um, Sacagawea, who helped them survive wilderness travels, uh, riverboat travels that they were not good at, um, but she was, right? So these ideas that the colonizers were carrying with them, right, they used to also create ideas within the societies around them so that they could justify the negative treatment of Native American people so they could justify taking land by saying Native people are just, quote, Indians. And that's when you see in this early period in the 1500s, the word Indian and the S word, these are in the word. Another S word is the word savage. Right? We don't talk about that very much. Um, that's become a very popular word, one that people use to empower themselves, non-Native people use all the time, but it is one that was um, very dangerous for our people. You can go to the next slide. So laws are used to articulate people's rights, what kind of protections they get, the consequences of violating those rights. But it's also the place where we see what we call the logic of human difference, where race or somebody's sex at birth, if you're called a female or a male at birth or intersex at birth, then your rights follow a certain pathway. And they can be very different than somebody else, even your own sibling or someone in your household. So some of the earliest terms that show up in colonial law are Indian country. It's not what our people called it, right? Indians, right? Which was a way to say, to move from honoring the different native people, the Powhatan, right? The Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, right? To collapse all native people into this larger just group of Indians. Right? And as soon as that word Indian took root in colonial minds, I'm not talking about how native people talk about each other or ourselves. I'm talking about the colonial mind, the colonial mentality, right? For whom Indians are, um, uh, sent, what do you call, uh, can simultaneously be used with the word hostile, right? Any of the S words, braves, right? These are all very limited versions, stereotypical, versions of, of human beings, right? Hostiles is another term that was used that you could, if you were defined as hostile by law, then the type of violence during that Western expansion that Malachi and also Morningstar were talking about, right? The, when you label people hostile, the type of violence you can use against them is similar to the type of violence you can use um, against animals. So these are all things that were written into the law, right? expansion laws and um, US laws, um, including the constitution, which also uses uh, the word savages to um, make a distinction between what they saw as proper Americans and native Americans. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So this is just a, um, a piece where you can see that the first time, um, this idea that Native Americans should be um, collapsed into a, a single group um, as Indians, and then argued to be only um, good enough to be enslaved for the purposes of colonizers occurs in, in the 1550s in Spain. And that takes off throughout Europe where other like, you know, English, French, et cetera, they write their own laws of expansion. They'd already been enslaving people throughout the world. They'd already been taking, property, they'd already been, um, you know, putting place names on things. But in the 1500s, they were realizing they needed to make it legal. And so this is where you start to see these terms showing up in written law in the 1550s. But as you can see in the quote, um, much of that argument is built on um, Aristotle's argument that it's just by human nature that some people are born um, to be enslaved and to um, serve others. And this concept that Malachi brought up of superiors and inferior people, right, gets written into law. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
I see the doctrine of discovery. That's that's a massively important part of this history. Um, the one of the ways to understand it is the importance of the word discovery. This concept again that, that the colonizer was discovering a world that was other in otherwise inhabited by people who were incapable of um, social organizing or civil life, right? So it's like having a fiction in your mind and then going around the world using weaponry and violence, right? To enforce your power to live that life, right? And the doctrine of discovery was one of the very first legal documents um, it's it's a very complex history. It goes back to the uh, one of the I think the fifth pope who made some arguments about the importance that um, Spain and other European colonizers ruled the world. Right. So this is a book I wanted to share. It was uh, gifted to me years ago, and um, it is the actual story of Pocahontas's. Um, people, the, the Mataponi people, and they take a, a section from about um, 1607 to about 1612, during the time that the English, um, what in the US version, the English settled Jamestown, it's actually um, Chief Wahansanaka who, um, her father who offers them a piece of land so that they can survive. It's a phenomenal book. And as they say in the beginning, you have not read this story we don't know this story. As they say in this quote, it's vastly different from the history you have been taught from school novels and movies, right? Next slide, please. So they go through the book and they share all of these sort of differences in the ways that Powhatan society, which is the Powhatan people are the nation and then the Mataponi people were um, Pocahontas's people, family people. Um, and her father was the uh, principal chief. Um, and so the Powhatan oral history shows that the English um, sort of created a fiction about the Pat Powhatan, created this idea that they could say, well, they're just savages, so it doesn't matter what we do to them. And as they argued in their own oral history from the 1600s, there were markers in that history as it translated into English that they believed that the English wanted to conceptualize them as savages so that they could take their land. And then you see in their own philosophy, they say things like people don't, do not just kill other people without some kind of justification for their, for their conscience unless they're simply killers. And over and over in the book, they return to this point that they say at the end, the English were looking for ways to take and slave and kill, right? And so on the one hand, the English and different colonizers are writing about Native Americans in a way using the S word, using Indian, using the other S word, right, to justify what they're doing. But they had no real evidence to base that on. Go to the next slide, please. And this um, is another piece of that history that they share that um, those colonizers, um, just like um, Sarah Winnemucca out here um, in, in the Western uh, California region and a bit broader than that Nevada region, Sarah Winnemucca wrote of these same kind of stories about how they were so unsafe, unsafe with settlers who were violating women, violating girls without a care of the type of suffering that it had on the human condition of, of you know, the victims. You can go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to point this out because as we're all working together, trying to push for a change, this is something that, that uh, Pocahontas' descendants who put this book together uh, call for. They want her remains returned to them. Right. And so part of the reason I want to share this is because I find it important to remember because this work can be very isolating at times. We can feel very alone and it's 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 a life's work and we want fast change and sometimes it takes longer. Um, and so we can really draw um, on each other as allies to say we're all in this kind of work. The family is still in 2007. They published the book 2007. Right, and it's um, 2021 now, and they're still trying to get the remains of their ancestor back. She died at 21 years old, right? Um, due to the violence against her, they had kidnapped her, taken her on a ship, 
Um, there's children present, so I don't want to go into the harsh details, but um, but it is um, if you took the story of what happened to Pocahontas, right, and you compared it to any given story among uh, missing and murdered, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You wouldn't know that one is in 1609 and the other is in 2021, right? The practice, the treatment remains. And I think for me and for a lot of us, this is because of that early renaming, not only of the lands, but the bodies, the people, right? You can go to the next slide, please. So this is a really useful piece of work that Barbara Perry did. Um, she studied here in California and PL 280 states, um, which are the five um, states in the United States with the highest number of Native Americans. The federal government allowed for the passing of a law that said, actually states can have some jurisdictional power over Native Americans in those particular states, right? But what she found in her research, and she interviewed police officers and detectives and FBI, um, she found a couple of things. One is that the S word is one of the most common terms used when a Native American woman or girl is detained by police or questioned, even if they're the victim, that the S word is what they call them. They don't call them by their name. Right. This is important. These are police officers. How safe can you feel when you're calling for help? In an urban environment like this, we have to think about these things. She reveals also that there's an over-policing, meaning over-surveillance in Native communities and on Native communities, but very little help or intervention. What we also find for those of us who do actually work um, on this MMIW, GEP, Two-Spirit people, right, that in the U.S. it's Suppose that police uh, begin a search 24 hours after a, a missing person has been reported. Nationwide police response to missing persons in Native American communities, even like here in Fresno in this county, uh, an average of five days. It takes them five days. We know in law enforcement that within the first 48 hours, you have the absolute best chance of finding someone. So we have to think of what, what allows for this negligence, this neglect to happen and place names matter. When the people themselves are calling for the change to say, please stop calling it this, this is harmful. It takes my dignity is not a word. Um, I don't think you'd wanna call your grandma that, right? Uh, personalize it so people get a, a grip. Um, we're not being listened to. And I think it goes all the way back to this concept of why would we be listened to if this is how we're conceptualized in law enforcement, in laws, in newspapers, right? Um, if you want to just kind of scroll through the rest of the slides, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share, the Tribal on Order Act. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, Violence Against Women Act, these are two major federal laws. Um, the Tribal Law and Order Act was supposed to, in 2010, address violence against Native American women. The Violence Against Women Act did not include until 2013 Native American women who are uh, tribally enrolled, living on reservations and rancherias. Next slide, please. These are just some um, images of uh, President Obama signing the Tribal on Order Act, but what happened right afterwards was um, they took out all the most meaningful aspects of it. The Tribal on Order Act pays a lot more for clinics and does some important work. Uh, but if you can go to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, maybe I missed one of my slides here, but what I wanted to share is that 86% of the perpetrators of violence against Native American women um, are non-Native people and the Tribal Law and Order Act still upholds that um, tribal justice systems don't have jurisdiction over um, non-Native Americans. So that's a really, that's a really big, um, way of gutting the Tribal Law and Order Act. And next slide, please. Thank you for helping out. And I just wanted to point out um, this slide, the next slide, please. These are actual women who have and continue to do amazing work on behalf of Native communities and in particular against violence. Um, and so, as I said, when I was a kid, I would ask my mom, like, why do they call Native Americans Indians? Why do they think of Native people in these ways when I was learning to see people with dignity, humor, 
um, generosity, strength, kindness, right? And it was my mom who said, they don't see it. That's not what they're seeing. They're not naming um, these, these uh, behaviors that they're seeing. This is a power drive, she would call it. So um, these are some of our powerful people who can um, and continue to leave uh, Black Bear passed on. Um, but Anita Lucchese, grad student, created a tracking system to track uh, missing and murdered people because we're, we're just not getting the help we need from the federal government. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. There's some other images on the slide. You're welcome to um, share with others. This is an artist who um, years ago was trying to bring attention by putting out these um, on streets, putting out all these lit candles for all the women who are suffering because of things like the idea of, of the S word being our real um, capacity as people. So thank you for your time, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lee Oliver. Thank you very much for speaking and um, educating us all. Thank you. Um, at this time, um, I'd like to, for us to read a few comments that we've collected um, during the course of our previous two speakers. And then um, we'll share with you the resolution that we have proposed to the Board of Supervisors here in Fresno County. Okay, so starting with Grace who commented, I have often said our community needs to teach and encourage Native pride, especially since it's not an automatic condition. Um, Ken Hudson asks, what would be the process of coming up with a proposal for a new name? What is the process of getting consensus from Indigenous peoples for a new name? Um, Stephanie Ramos asked, what is the new name? Uh, and also, where can uh, they donate to the campaign? Roman, um, do you want to go ahead and answer that now? or? Yeah, uh, so um, i like to share with uh, um, everybody here in attendance uh, the resolution that we'd like to propose to the Fresno County Board of Supervisors. Unfortunately, they have been completely unreceptive to it and refused to even add us to the agenda. And additionally, Supervisor Magtick has never welcomed us or allowed us uh, the time to at least hear us out. He just made his judgment. Um, but we have proposed Noon Valley because the roadmap to renaming laid out by Supervisor Maxick's office was that it needs to start organically from the community, which it has. It needed to have a petition online, which Change York has. It's approaching 15,000 uh, 15, signatures at the moment. And additionally, it needed to have a name, a proposed name. We propose Noon Valley. It's not a name that we are uh, dug our heels in. In fact, a lot of residents have suggested Bear Mountain Valley, uh, which is being um, used currently the, the name of the library locally. It's currently uh, used on several uh, businesses. Merchants have that in, there in the valley. So at this time, I, I really like to uh, address the, the survey and uh, ask you what you think before I go into uh, how you can help uh, financially and uh, with your signatures and in other ways. So thank you, uh, your surveys really do help. They allow us to uh, regroup and see what the audience really likes. Uh, we've put up a call to action. Here are all the Fresno County Board of Supervisors. Uh, contrary to their belief and uh, the, the Chief Administrator Officer, Jean Rousseau, who uh, works directly with the Board of Supervisors, I feel that this uh, problem with the name is only confined to the borders of S Valley, which is not. Um, names are powerful, even if, uh, even if unintentional, the current name is harmful. Um, names help shape our identity. They provide representation and visibility. 
And um, I'd like to go back to what D Dr. Lee Oliver said is that two of the statistics that really stood out for me, one that she shared was that the average response time for missing and murdered members of our community, female members of our community is five days, but the non-native uh, members of uh, the surrounding American community is 24 hours. And that goes to show that this name lends itself to complicity, um, not thinking that it is a, a derogatory term that is not pejorative, that rather is a term of honor, when in fact it is not, goes to aid people in calling us that, uh, seeing us represented as that, and eventually doesn't really warrant the response that it should when it is in dire need. Um, so again, you know, we like to say that this is an American crisis that is not being talked about. And, uh, and I say that because if it can happen to one of our members at the Golden Globes, then it can happen to our, our mothers, our sisters, and our daughters. And that's what brings me to another uh, statistic that I really found uh, profound. And that is one in three Native American women, indigenous women in their lifetime will will experience this. And this name lends itself to that complicity. This name enables and cultivates an environment where people feel empowered that they can get away with this and act on this. And that's what we're really trying to educate um, the Board of Supervisors about, especially Mr. Maxick, that one in three. So when we're saying that we need to change this and you're telling us no, because um, you spoke to um, a few handful of representatives, um, that's not good enough for us. Um, we are hearing that, or at least I am hearing that, you're okay with my mother, my sister, or my daughter experiencing that. And in addition, you're okay with representing a town that bears a pejorative as its name. And you're okay being that elected official, even though you were elected um, with uh, no, no, uh, you were grandfathered in basically with nobody to run against you. Um, that's not okay with us. And that's what we're here to say is that hopefully with the new education, with the, the, the new information, that you won't be able to turn away from the facts. You won't be able to turn away from the reality that is based in our community, that this is a dire situation for our females. This is our dire situation that we parents have to contend with, with our daughters, raising our daughters in a safe environment, um, worry with our mothers and our sisters, knowing somebody who has experienced this in their lifetime and knowing that this word lends itself to that. Um, this is why we come together in a positive way. We don't mean to come across as uh, negative. We don't mean to say you're wrong and this is right. That is far from it. In fact, that's why we uh, put out the survey to garner what you, the residents, would think uh, is the best name for the renaming. Um, we have heard predominantly from the residents there in S Valley, here in S Valley, that um, Bear Mountain Valley would be a, a suitable alternative um, if it is to be renamed. Uh, we chose Noom Valley because um, it is a, it means the people in the Western Mono language it is also a word that is uh, uh, found in all of the tribes located in that very, with a variation with the course of the different dialects um, in all the languages of the tribes that are found in the valley. And also keep in mind, all of the tribes, not a single tribe in that area is federally recognized. That means, um, we are already acting, we are already being told by the federal government that we are not something in fact what we already are. We are already combating that. And this name adds to that. And that's what we're trying to get across. And we're trying to understand, try to protect that this is an intergenerational trauma. That I am not the first to, to seek this change. We are not the first to seek this change. There have been other movements before us in the 90s. There have been other efforts in the 70s. So this is a generational thing. You see the next generation on our uh, flyer. You see um, the youth representative speaking today. Um, if this does not get resolved, there is a whole other line of generation coming right behind us that will pick up the baton and we will be right back here. And hopefully that will not be the case. Hopefully 
you will see how it is affecting us in our community and exasperating the missing, murdered, and indigenous women in our communities and that crisis in America. Um, hopefully it will shed light on that crisis. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to shed light on the situation, trying to come together um, to heal as a community. And this is really where it begins. And to get to the point where uh, folks have uh, offered donations monetarily, um, we've uh, started a GoFundMe page, but we have uh, kind of resisted. We're putting it out there at the moment because we want 100% of the funds to go to the impacted merchants that currently bear that name for their business. Um, we find that we are part of the community with you. We are there at the library with you. We're there at the post office, checking our mail with you, getting the gas with you, shopping at the Dollar General with you now. We are members of your community and we're not trying to impose our will on you. We're trying to educate you and illuminate the crisis that is going on in our respective communities. And at the same time, state, if you're an impacted merchant, we want to stand by you and say, we are here to help you financially. So for those that want to uh, uh, contribute monetarily, um, please uh, send us your email. We will be in further touch of how you can do so. And for those that are from the local casino tribes, we'd like to call on you to step up because this is not just a, a problem confined in those borders. This is a problem that is also affecting your tribe as well. And these impacted merchants shouldn't have to bear the cost solely. We don't know if the Board of County Supervisors has any funds uh, to offset those uh, costs of change, but as we're taking the lead here to have this discussion, to have a discussion of what the name should be proposed, we also like to lead that discussion and uh, financially be in there for you impacted merchants. Um, we don't wanna just come in and say, this is what the name's gonna be, and now you're left to deal with it, especially in the COVID era with it being financially, uh, uh, it could be financially uh, dire in, in our COVID era. So as a community, we wanna step up and show our solidarity with you and support you uh, with those costs. Additionally, I like to uh, uh, touch on that, that the continual acceptance of the geographic naming is contrary to the Fresno County Board of Supervisors state of vision and guiding principles. Their state of vision is working together for a quality life for all, not the majority, not those who vote, but for everybody. And we are part of that community. And we like for the Fresno Board of County Supervisors to uphold and personify their own stated vision. And in addition with that, their guiding principles, which state, and I quote, working together for a quality of life for all, respecting and embracing ethnic and cultural diversity. And that's really what we're asking for, is to respect and, and, and appreciate our cultural diversity. Uh, us as indigenous people, us as fathers trying to raise indigenous women, the next generation, us as sons of indigenous mothers, we're asking for you to adhere and, and recognize your own guiding principles and and tune in to that this is much larger than just changing a name, that this lends itself to a, a much larger dire crisis um, that afflicts all of our districts in Fresno County, uh, whether it be uh, Buddy Mendez, Brian Pacheco's, Steve Brandau's, or Sal Contreras, all of our residents are affected here in Fresno County. And this is why all of you uh, Board of Supervisors should be addressing this and not just Supervisor Maxey. And with that, I just really like to say, you know, you know, that this is where the healing begins. That if we are successful in renaming it, that that name on that sign that you're currently seeing on the slide won't change immediately. That will be just changed when it's the normal schedule time to update the signs. So that could be a few years from now. Um, we understand that. We also understand that with the board of uh, the United States Board on Geographic Naming, they also favor names that are currently being used, such as uh, what has been proposed by a numerous residents, um, Bear Mountain Valley. So 
that's why the surveys are very important to us. Your input is very important to us. And I know you must all have very, uh, must have uh, lots of questions and comments. And I know uh, several people from the community, especially those from the Valley have expressed their interest in speaking with me directly. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to, to address that in the chat and uh, we can read this and I can go ahead and answer your questions directly now. So Ken Hudson, um, I think you, you'll want to take this first, Roman. Uh, would it be worth uh, pursuing changing the name to Dunlap um, from the Dunlap Band of Mono to replace S Valley? Dunlap is a neighboring community only eight miles away as the area's only public schools. Uh, that's an excellent question and thank you. Um, I, I don't think that would be a, a, a viable option because there's multiple tribes in the area. And when I did reach out to the Dunlap Band of Mono Indians, um, that was the first thing they acknowledged that they weren't the only tribe in the area. And in fact, uh, they actually referred me to the Wachumni tribe and told me that you know they were probably gonna be the most impacted immediately of all the tribal groups in the valley. So um, I, I think that's a wonderful question, but I, I don't think that's a, a viable option for said reasons. Connie made a comment saying that Bear Mountain Valley is too wieldy. It would need to be shorter and more succinct. Yeah, and that's all things we're um, here to discuss. This isn't the, the, the first and the last. Um, there will be other forums. There will be other gatherings as we move forward. Um, it's more of us trying to let people know why we are trying to do this. And... Uh, and, and get our petition strengthened. And uh, perhaps you're absolutely right. Maybe it is too wordy, um, but it has been one of the names that have been suggested by multiple residents and um, seems to be have the most traction from the residents there in the Valley. Um, Daisy said to please put the script in the chat to copy and paste, please. So if one of my colleagues can go ahead and do that. Um, Connie, responds and saying they would be in favor of changing it to Dunlap as it would possibly lend to other benefits with increasing the populous number and a good portion of the 93675 area, which was actually Dunlap previously. Yeah, that's something we definitely could consider. Um, you know, we haven't had an opportunity to really sit down and speak with Maxig directly. Uh, we hope that would be something he does offer us. Um, where we can sit down and dialogue this. Um, this is just that one step forward towards renaming. And um, I, I definitely value your input. And that's something we will uh, bring up and address. So thank you. Um, Grace said, in support of merchants, why not have a gathering to bring in business and meet our Native community? Much blessings are needed. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful idea. Uh, something I, I hadn't even thought of or hadn't even heard of. And thank you very much for that idea. Uh, I will most definitely make note of it and uh, bring it up for discussion amongst our group when we do regroup. Um, and you may have alluded to this earlier, Roman, but Ken asked, where are we in the name change process other than uh, sign on petitions? What can we do to help? Uh, what you can do immediately to help is to either email or call or both uh, your local representative in the Board of Supervisors, or all of them, and of course the CAO Gene Rousseau himself. Um, that's what you can immediately do. But where we're actually right now is uh, trying to dialogue with the community, gather community response, so that we can uh, strengthen our application to the United States Board of uh, Geographic Naming. Unfortunately, that board only meets twice a year. So there's about a six month wait after we do actually submit our petition. And there's about a 90 day wait for it actually to appear on their website after we submit it. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Um, just here to dialogue and see what other people think about the name. Again, a lot of people have uh, really shown uh, uh, a, a negative response to our proposed name of Noom Valley. Uh, again, that's why we're here to really say that's not what we're trying to impose. It was merely a suggestion. It was something that was asked upon by Supervisor Maxig's office that we come um, to terms with that we have to have proposed in order to move forward. And so that's what we have just for the, the resolution purposes, but it's not something that we uh, are adamant about. 
Okay, Charles Logan comments, you have the right as human beings and first people of this land to change the name of places that were uh, used to offend you. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we brought down the statue of Columbus. We didn't discover nothing. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Um, and a side note, if uh, anyone from Valley Natives for Change is on, someone did ask how to directly donate. So if you could drop that information in the chat for them. Um, another commenter said, this effort to change the name of S Valley is long overdue. Um, several years ago, the federal government went through the effort to change all derogatory names on federal lands, but they didn't go far enough on places like S Valley, unfortunately, still exist and are a slap in the face to folks of color. Yeah. Um, and a, a chapter member, Erica Cruz said, how can I personally exert pressure on that uh, recalcitrant councilman, <laughs> Councilman Magzig? What are your thoughts there? Um, I, again, I think uh, just calling, emailing and asking, saying, hey, you haven't even given this group the time of day. You've denied us at the uh, the public forum during the public forum at your board of supervisors meeting. You've never welcomed us to your office. You never asked to sit down. All we ask is something to the extent, uh, Mr. Maxig is, uh, I, I guess what we kind of expect, or at least what I kind of expected from Supervisor Maxig was something along the lines of you saying, hey, I don't promise you that I'm going to support it. I don't promise you that I'm not going to support it. What I do promise you is that as you, as my constituent, and as your elected official, that I will sit down and listen to you, that I will give you my undivided attention and hear you out. But right now, we feel like we're continuously being ignored. And that's why we had to take this forum to kind of get our word out. It, it also lends itself into the word itself. Um, many of the females in our communities feel ignored, feel disrespected. And it's kind of uh, the same situation in which um, the Board of Supervisors has made us feel, um, just told us to go away, seem to have made up their mind already and really doesn't wanna say anything. So if you wanna help, reach out directly to um, Supervisor Maxick, if not all of the supervisors and including the Chief Administrative Officer, Gene Rousseau, and let them know how you feel. Um, tell them that they should give us the time, should hear us out. Um, we shouldn't have to go around them and do this. There should be a partnership uh, with our elected officials to reach an amicable solution because we're not here trying to disrupt anything. We're a community and in a community in a time of need pulls together, doesn't fight one another, pulls together. And that's what we are. We're a community and I cannot stress that enough. So I have two similar comments. Um, Roseanne Dominguez asked, I'm curious, when were the actual local natives from S Valley, not from surrounding communities, asked about changing the name? I understand the power of words and I understand the power we can give to words. While I can understand and will sympathize with people who have suffered by past actions of others, my family has apparently never had a problem with the word. My ancestors have been here since the conquistadors and we do not want our name changed. And another individual named Salina Dominguez, have you talked to the native families who live in S Valley? Yeah, uh, I, it was really it was very easy for me. I I'm, I am done like Banamono, and I am Choi Numni, so it was very easy for me to start talking to tribal members. Um, immediately started with my own family members, and from there they direct me to other community members. And, and with that, I want to say that I respect your opinion, I value your opinion, but I also want to acknowledge that resistance to change is normal, but. Being that this is derogatory and a pejorative, that shouldn't be um, any reason to say, oh, well, I've been used to this all along and um, this is the way I like it. Um, there's a whole community that's impacted and we need to take the consensus of the entire community and, sh and, and hear us out because the majority of the native people that I have encountered by and large are for it. Maybe not for the proposed name, but they are certainly for renaming it. 
So we received similar comments in the chat and Morningstar responded with, I see a lot of comments of claims of not speaking to local tribal peoples in the area. When they are speaking to you now, open the event uh, and are attending and participating in this town hall. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Morningstar. Um, and one observation from Jamie, after starting the petition to uh, change the Fresno High mascot, I quickly discovered an immediate moving of goalposts by opposition voices. Fortunately, our plan was succinct and sturdy. Uh, we relentlessly relied on one, sharing our anecdotal um, stories, our history, because our stories matter. Two, rely on the existing data that showcases why names like this are problematic. We didn't choose uh, fallacious narratives. We methodically moved forward with our petition, our plan, keep moving. We support your collective efforts. Thank you. And that's really our next step is um, to finalize our petition to the board on geographic naming. If there uh, are there any more comments or uh, questions? There's there's additional support in the chat. Um, I'll end with Leticia Aguilar, who said, change the name, it's sexist and racist, period. Well, thank you. I wanna thank all of you, and especially uh, our youth, Mr. Malachi Suarez. Uh, thank you very much for uh, speaking and sharing with us and showing that this isn't just a, a singular word. It, it's just rampant throughout our community. And it does take uh, individuals like you, Malachi, to kind of waken us up and thank you very much to that. Um, it was something I wasn't aware of and to you brought it to my attention. So thank you very much. As well as uh, I'd like to thank all of our other panelists, uh, Morningstar, James, uh, Dr. Lee Oliver. I'd like to thank you all for helping us get the word out to educate our community. And of course, all of you um, with the ACLU, um, this couldn't have been done without you. Thank you very much. And if you have any additional questions or concerns, um, please feel uh, free to reach out to us. Um, we can be reached readily available at uh, our email, which is simply renamed squawvalley at gmail.com. Thank you very much. And I wish you all a, a wonderful evening. Thank you.